Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I decided to go for the information compression and make my uh, title a little bit shorter. I also have two confessions to make. So the confession number one is I am neither mathematician nor deep learning expert. I am an experimentalist who does uh, inorganic and solid state chemistry using the microscopy. And uh, over time, I have learned quite a bit of machine learning because this is something that we really need to work with the data set and make sense out of it. The second confession, which is part of the reason why I'm very excited to be here, is that for the things that we are doing on the mathematics side, we're doing them somehow, but we're always looking for opportunities to uh, connect and kind of make the science better. So with uh, other further ado, let me show you where I work. So this is the Center for Nanophase Material Science in Oak Ridge. So this is the CNMS itself. This is a spallation neutron source. So this is a several billion dollar facility. Uh, we have uh, old nuclear reactors here. We have a nuclear weapon plant here. So it's a place, one of the original sites for the Manhattan projects, the place with the very rich uh, scientific and not only history. Uh, but the thing that matters, especially in this community, is this is the place which has a lot of tools that generates extremely large volumes of well-structured data with the high physical content. And uh, for a lot of time, so I've been here for about uh, 17 years, for a lot of time my program was uh, dedicated to the development of the scanning probe microscopy techniques, and more recently on the applications of the machine learning tools uh, for the SPM and electron microscopy data. So I have a book coming out with the in Foster in the next few months, which summarizes some of this accomplishment. Now, in the beginning, uh, our program was focused on the scanning probe microscopy technique. So here the idea is that you have a tip, this tip goes in contact with the surface, and you use it to induce the local chemical and electrochemical processes. And the way we run the SPM was to apply them to study the tip induced processes like chemical reaction, polarization switching, electrochemistry. And by while doing it, we started to develop more and more complex uh, techniques in terms of the data acquisition. So this is our uh, roadmap in terms of the data volumes. So in about year 2016, we go to the point of people coming to our facility and generating something like tens to hundreds of gigabytes of data. So the reason I'm saying that is that during all this time, we face the problem of how you're going to work with these volumes of data, and more importantly, what you're going to learn from this particular data. So we went a pathway from using simple things like PC and uh, simple backprop networks all the way to using the more recent advanced tools. And there's many people in the field of machine learning. I can say that in 2009, we had the first paper for neural networks, and of course, the response was, who cares about the neural network? That's absolutely useless thing in microscopy. So anyway, uh, after doing it for quite a while, or and I'll have realized that machine learning is great, microscopy is great, and the question that we were given by Ornell and Dewey was, how can we use microscopy to improve the materials design? So how can we make materials better? And uh, I'm sure all of you know this paper by Gerd Sider, who basically said, look, theories can calculate a lot of uh, systems. We need some ways to sort through the theoretical calculations, and uh, machine learning allows you to do exactly that, and this is how the Materials Genome Project started. And uh, the targets for Materials Genome are very well known, so we want to improve materials, we want to discover materials, and we want to ultimately engineer materials. So all factors like functionality, manufacturability, and cost matters. For example, carbon nanotubes can, in principle, be used to build the space elevator. They have the sufficiently good mechanical properties. However, until they can be manufactured at cost, we are not going to have space elevator, no matter what Elon Musk may or may not say. So uh, this is why it is a materials problem. And then the question becomes, can machine learning help us to accomplish this vision? And I think that, I mean, all of you know the history of machine learning and science extremely well with the AI winters and the resurgences. And I think that uh, anyone who encounters this field for the first time start to have this uh, strange feeling as to why did it not work before? So what's different now? 
And if you write the proposals, you always have to answer this question because, for example, your management or funding agencies know that AI was tried for materials discovery in the 90s, and at that time it didn't work. So you need to convince people that it will work this time. And I think that very important statement here is the statement by Freeman Dyson, who basically said that all the scientific revolutions were brought by concepts or by tools. So the concept is the Kuhnian vision of the science, but tool is uniquely Dyson invention. And one very important thing is that what's different now compared to before is that this is the first time when the machine learning become a tool that experimentally such as myself can use. So you don't have to be an MIT in the C-Sale to write something. A person who barely knows programming can use Python and Google Notebook and uh, analyze the specific data set. So this is what is different now compared to a long time before. Now, so this being said, how can uh, microscopy help us to discover the materials? And uh, if we want to talk about the materials, we need to look at them in the chemical space. So materials are ultimately a collection of atoms. Uh, we can calculate the energy as a function of their coordinates. The problem is that this space is too large to even being thought about. So practically, people talk about the chemical space, meaning the minima, uh, which correspond to stable or the metastable compounds. So the issue of finding the right material for the problem becomes the issue of search in this chemical space. And we all know that machine learning tools, so given the example of Google or Facebook or whatever, we all know that machine learning is absolutely outstanding when it comes to the search problem. So the question becomes, why is it diff difficult? And the answer is, it is very difficult for the reasons that you deal with very anomalous space. So first of all, the space is non-differentiable. I know that Anatole thinks otherwise, so the caveat should be that for theorists is differentiable, for experimentalists is not. I cannot just go from alkane to, from ethane to ethanol, no matter how I want ethanol at any particular moment. Uh, the pathways between the different regions are also not obvious. And the very important thing is that the useful functionalities can be very complex and poorly understood. Basically, you work in the space which is not differentiable, so if I get the gradient descent. And secondly, you also, your cost function is either poorly defined or not defined at all. So for example, band gaps and Young moduli we can calculate, but biological activity and things like superconductivity, not so much. And the thing which is the most important that when we deal with the materials discovery, we do not need to find behavior in general. I really don't need to know what 95% of materials are doing. I need to find an outlier. I need to find the material which is best for my specific problem. So if you take these three factors, non-differentiability, not known cost function, and the need for outliers, you can figure out why using machine learning for materials discovery whether it is in organic chemistry or biology or whatever, is complicated. That's a very poorly defined problem. But there is always a but, which gives us a hope. And the hope is that very often the underlying physical laws are relatively well known, and they are simple. So everyone has their own definition of what you deal with machine learning for materials, but, and what is the causality and how you do it, but the important thing for me is that there is a law. Now, let's look at a few examples. So if you look at something like simple molecules, so if you look at the Wikipedia, it will tell you that the dimensionality of the chemical space is 10 to the power of 63, and then it will make a comment that this is if it is less than 30 atoms. Nonetheless, for small molecules, there are ways to deal with it. There are programs like Chematica by Bartosz Grzybowski that analyze the literature and allow you to navigate. There are modern laboratory robotics that allows you to atomize synthesis. And in many cases, you know something about the functionalities. So biologists are particularly good in it, and organic chemists are getting there. But this is the molecules. For solid material, situation is totally different. So for example, a few years ago, Stephen Cortarola tried to analyze solids almost like a molecular system and find the correlation between the structure and the superconductive properties. And if you look at this diagram, so this is the all-known compounds and structural elements, if you look at the discovery, you can figure out that discovery was always serendipitous. So we discovered copper superconductors 30 years ago, and then around this point, we found all the compositional uh, substitutional systems. So there was a whole cluster of materials. 
Then we found magnesium boride in uh, early 2000, and it's unique, it's a single point. There is no other compound like it. You dope it, it stops being superconductor. Then we discovered iron nactides. Again, we have found a whole family. Notice that these materials have absolutely nothing in common with each other. Each time, discovery was serendipitous, and in some cases, we were able to find materials which are almost similar, but who knows how many surprises are out there. So if we start to think about even uh, known composition classes as a search process, it becomes very depressing because, for example, look at the phase diagram for real material. This is the phase fields. Imagine that this is not three-dimensional but five-dimensional phase diagram. Imagine that your optimal properties are somewhere in the region with the, say, within one compositional percent. If you want to go for doping, then you need to maintain things down to 10 minus 6. So think about it as the, a search problem. It's really not easy. This space is not differentiable. Once you cross the boundary, your kernels start to be discontinuous. So what can we do? Is science hopeless? And of course, science is not hopeless. And the reason why science is generally not hopeless is because very often we can go pretty far if we start to discuss the solid materials essentially using the mean field descriptors. For example, symmetry, concentration, or the parameter uh, corresponding thermodynamic potential. So this is what physicists like to do. They love to think about solids as materials where all unit cell is the same, and therefore one unit cell represents the rest of the material if there is a periodic boundary conditions. Unfortunately, it's not true. If you look at the materials, especially the interesting materials in the electron microscope, this is how they look like. So here, the each pixel is the uh, unit cell, and the color is the parameter of this unit cell. So you see this complex modulated structures, you see some periodicity, you see the grain boundaries. So unit cells are definitely not all, not all the same. They have some complex order, they have some boundaries between them, and the problem is that they're really interesting materials, ferroelectric relaxers, KTF materials that can be one of the models for uh, quantum computing. They all organize like this. They're inhomogeneous on the nanoscale. So the challenge becomes, how can we describe solids so what is our equivalent of smiles or any other type of notation for solids? How can we describe them beyond the symmetry-based methods? How we discuss over the structure property relationships? How we use this information for prediction? So in the beginning, description, then forward models. So it turns out that the wonderful technique for doing it is the electron microscopy. So this is how it looks like. You have the electron source. You have a set of... Uh, Interestingly, machine learning enabled equipment that focuses the electron beam. It goes through the solid. Uh, you have a monochromator and detector that measures the energy. And uh, it allows you to do wonderful things. So it allows you to visualize the structure of solid with the rather amazing detail. So each blob here is a single atom. It allows you to uh, create the energy spectra, which tell how much energy the electron beam loses to plasmons, photons, phonons, and so on. It allows you to make a subatomic diffraction. And the number of the questions that we can start asking here is rather amazing. So, look at it this way. Traditionally, if you're an organic chemist, you know that if I tell you the distance between the two carbon atoms, you would be able to tell me how reactive this material. If you're a physicist and I give you the average metal oxygen metal bond length and angle, you can tell me whether this is a, a ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. Electron microscopy in the last 10 years, almost invisibly for the rest of the scientific community, crossed the boundary between being the field that just give the images of the solid structures to the field that gives you quantitative information on the position. So the information that was previously available only on average from scattering as a pair distribution function, you can now have it in real space. And the question becomes, what are you going to do with all of that? So of course, there are many other things that electron microscopy does. So in the, literally in the last five years, due to the commercialization of the aberration correction, there are things like subatomic diffraction, beams with orbital momentum, beam manipulation, and so on and so forth. So this field now goes like this. And the question becomes is that it generates large volumes of data. What can we learn out of this data? So since I work for the Department of Energy National Lab, and that sort of structures your scientific process in a proper way, 
we wrote a roadmap about uh, how can we learn physics from microscopy data, either electron or probe. So the first type of problems is, okay, having a microscopy image is wonderful, but that's not what I can give to theorists or anybody else. So the first problem is that I need to take my uh, microscopy data and convert it to the material-specific information, for example, atomic coordinates or scattering potential and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, I also want to find out how much I can trust this data. So uncertainty quantification is a really, really big thing. So the second thing is that if I have this material-specific information with known uncertainties, can I use it to learn or infer physics or chemistry either through the correlative models or through the recovery of the generative physical model? And primarily, I will show about the examples of this approach and this approach. And then, of course, if I know this material's information, can I predict material's behavior? Now, where are we here? So this is being done by the microscopy community, and this is being done very well. This, of course, is being done by theorists, and uh, as far as I can say, it is done very well because I'm not a theorist. But this part is almost non-existent, so there is no bridge between the microscopy field and the theory field. And the question becomes, is the machine learning the way to build this field? Are there going to be some serendipitous discoveries? Yes. The nice thing about machine learning is that it is fast, or at least can be fast. Of course, you can always make it slow, but uh, important thing that it is fast, which means that it can allow you to make a connection to the on-the-fly experiment. When I run my electron microscope, can I use some machine learning model to change the way the microscope runs while I do the experiment? And not a week later after I analyze the data and think, damn, I should have done this, and it's now too late for doing that. So these are the two areas where our effort specializes. And now let me show you a few examples. So what you see here is the layered material. So this is molybdenum sulfide. And uh, it is being visualized by the ele uh, electron microscope. So each small blob here is an atom, or to be more precise, it's either a molybdenum atom or two sulfur atoms, one on top of each other. And you can see that you see them in real space. Now, if I show this movie to electron microscopist, he will tell me this is a beam damage. You really need to lower down the energy of your beam or minimize the exposure. But as I said, I'm actually also not a microscopist, electron microscopist by training. I'm a solid state chemist. So for me, this is something totally different. Think about it this way. I have a process where, by magic, we remove the sulfur atoms one by one with a sufficiently low cross-section. The material system becomes oversaturated in terms of molybdenum, and they start to nucleate the low, material, low uh, oxidation state molybdenum sulfides. So basically what I see is I see a solid-state chemical process, and I see it one atom at a time. So, great. If I'm a little bit more ambitious, uh, then I can say, look, I have a collection of solid, of the solid objects. They interact through each other with the force fields. And then the question becomes, if I see them, they're dynamic, can I reconstruct the force fields based on this observation? This is, you know, if people can reconstruct, as uh, Peter Bartaglia has shown, you can reconstruct the motion of the um, Newtonian mechanics based on the observation of the motion of individual objects. Can you do the same thing here? I see the units moving. Okay, and here comes the problem. So the first problem becomes that for doing this, I need to find out the coordinates of all the atoms. So how can we do that? So for five years, we played with the correlative methods, half transforms, and it kind of worked. But microscope data always requires tuning. So you have a sequence of the thousands of videos, frames in the video, you need to tune it. It's not fully automatic. And then uh, three years ago, one of my colleagues said, you know what, there is this new thing, deep learning. How about I learn it? So he disappeared for half a year. I haven't seen him. And they said, yeah, now I can download uh, TensorFlow, and I can take a picture of my dog, I can download VCG19, and I can analyze it, and uh, the network, which never seen this dog, uh, can identify it. So once I learned to do it myself about half a year ago, I also made some interesting experiments. Yeah, it works like a charm. And then we took the network, put the image of the atomic structure, <laughs> and it all a wool, velvet, window screen, and whatever. And then we said, damn, what goes on? Very simple. Apparently, there are tens of thousands of people on the 
Google and Facebook that do create the label data of cats, cats and dogs. I'm not going to judge their motivation or output, but they've done it. And unfortunately, no one have tried to label the atoms for me. <laughs> so we had to figure out how to do it properly, and it turns out that this is a really exciting process because you can, when you create your training set, you can incorporate the knowledge and the uncertainty of your microscope performance when you create the training set. So it's actually kind of uh, works remarkably well. But then it starts to work like a charm because it takes a while to train the network, but then we can take a data set that looks like this and convert it into the data set that looks like this. So here, what you see here is the graphene. Is so the, if you squint properly, you will see this uh, kind of blobs, blobs with the carbon atoms. The bright blobs are silicon atoms. They're dancing around in this hole. And the network transforms this data set into this data set. So we can determine the probability density of each atom being visible. And, sure. Um, what's the how does the training work? Like, what's the supervised label? Uh, so you create a blobs, a blob array from just a, a high signal to noise ratio image. You augment it for possible distortions. So you add the jitter, you add the rotations after you add the jitter, you add the expansion and contraction, you add the skews, and then you train the network using these guys from the example. The important thing is to know in which range to apply the zooms and the uh, skews and so on. Is in simulation or, or like? How do you know? We use it from the uh, image. So in this case, we use it from the image which was acquired with the high signal to noise ratio. Oh, so it's like really easy to segment with like a kind of non deep learning method. Uh, yes, okay, exactly. So you're training it against. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So but you are, are, you, are you simulating the noise process? I mean, uh, when you say you do these, like you're adding these things in as sort of like a. We played with different strategies for the, doing this. For example, subtracting the atomic structure, getting the noise pattern, then blowing up the oh, noise yeah. pattern and adding it back to it. So we played with a lot of uh, ways to simulate and augment the data. As you can imagine, one of the problems becomes, when you show this on microscopy conference, the, conference, uh, the problem becomes how much do you trust it when it does, when does it break down. So you need to show the, say, look, I don't have it with in this presentation, but this is how we did the simulated data sets and so on and so forth. The thing that said that doesn't work is <laughs> what we tried first was to train the network using the simulated data. And it turns out that this is a overkill because if you want to find blobs, <coughs> that leads to overfits and just doesn't make any sense to do it. But remember what I said, that the deep learning in the beginning should be a tool. And once uh, it can be used on this level, it becomes a useful tool. And uh, so it's kind of appropriate. We have the microscopy domain on GitHub where all these tools are available for electron microscopy community or for all communities. And what's more important is that the network works really fast. So we can put it on the video stream from the microscope so it can also work in real time. Of course, it works not only for scanning probe microscopy. So this is the example of different system where we see the assembly of the protein nanoparticles. So these are roughly the same guys that cause the Alzheimer disease, except that they're in solution. And again, what you see here is an AFM image, and the deep learning network identifies where they, where they are. And it turned out that making networks that work for this problem is much more complicated, because finding the ellipsoidal blobs, is, which have some dispersion in sizes, is much more difficult than finding the round blobs, which are all the same. Nonetheless, it works remarkably well. So if you see here, these are barely visible, so I'm not even sure if you can see them on the screen. But the network reconstructs them remarkably well and tells us how much you can trust it. And then the question becomes, what's next? So the obvious thing is that, okay, if I look at the material and uh, I see the multiple atomic configurations, what I can do is I can start to build the libraries. And this is the example of the silicon atom and graphene when we find we have a stack of 1,000 images. They kind of correspond to the uh, possible, experimentally realizable states of the silicon atoms and vacancies in graphene. And all of a sudden, we can go on and create a library of possible configurations. Why does it matter? It matters because if I try to ask a theorist to calculate all possible configurations of silicons and carbon in the real material, this system will explode very, very rapidly. Remember that dimensionality of the chemical space is amazingly large. But for experimentalists, you don't need all of them. You need only those that are experimentally observed. And these are the ones which are experimentally observed with the frequency of the experimental observation. 
Now, before you go uh, to positive, in the ideal world, you can count the numbers and say that, look, we can determine the energies. Practically, of course, you cannot because the system is excited by electron beam. So this is not thermalized system. Nonetheless, each configuration is the metastable minimum. And we can always go to theorists and say, look, these are atomic configuration. Can you please calculate what would be the DFT energies, optimized geometries, and so on and so forth? And then you start to have a positive feedback. For example, the DFT can give us the optimized geometry. I can compare the optimal geometry with the experimentally observed one, and it starts to give me the strains inside the material because I see how the geometry of the cluster deviates from the ideal one. So long story short, we decided that uh, sharing is caring, so we worked with the citrine to share it. And uh, the interesting thing in the scientific community is that how do you convince experimentally share the code? So in this community, that's normal. In the experimental community, it's not normal. So we kind of explored the concept of uh, taking the normal scientific paper, dumping it into the Jupyter notebook, and then, you know, it's a paper and it's a code at the same time. And I have to admit that of all the things that change our life in two years, the whole concept of collabs and Jupyter notebooks is, uh, does wonders. Nonetheless, for the time being, we were strictly in the correlative world. But what we really want to do is to translate from the observations to understanding the fundamental mechanisms. And the joke that I usually make is that if you want to learn how to do it, physical community is not the right community to go. The right community is astronomy. Because astronomers, thankfully, don't get any opportunity to do experiments. Astronomers only do observations. The experiments are everywhere. You know, but it's not an experiment. You don't have, no matter how much I promised my wife, I was not able to write her name with the stars on the sky, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But no, it's purely observational science. But the uh, consequence is that astronomers are extraordinarily good in taking the observations and constructing the causative physical models out of that. So the question becomes, can physicists do that? And again, so as I... Uh, acknowledge I'm not a mathematician, but I'm a physicist, so let me show you an example. So one example is everyone's favorite materials, ferroelectrics. So this is a material which is a cubic perovskite under some conditions, and then if you lower the temperature, the central atom moves and the system develops the, uh, develops the uh, dipole moment. So physicists, as everybody else, like to show these diagrams when you have Vertical axis is energy. Horizontal axis is configuration coordinate, or if you're a biologist, that is some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the part of the molecule. So this type of slow degrees of freedom are established everywhere else. But what this configuration coordinate or the parameter means is that the macroscopic number of unit cells just moves in the, uh, moves in the lockstep. And of course, the theory can be slightly more complicated. So realistically, you uh, rather than having just the free energy as the kind of this type of double well potential, you have the landau ginzburg equation, so you have a functional of this order parameter. And this landau ginzburg description works extremely well. But there are two buts. The first but is that as any uh, differential equation problem, what happens in the material depends on the boundary conditions. And you don't know the boundary conditions. They need to be discovered, uh, postulated independently. And secondly, there are kind of materials where it is not clear where this theory even applies. So what can we do about it? So let me show you an example. So this is what we've done about 10 years ago when we said, look, for many material system, we can make the atomically resolved observation of simple defects. For example, antiphase boundary or interface. I can take a Ginzburg-Landau theory with the unknown boundary conditions. So there is uh, some correlation length or something like this. I can solve this because for simple geometry, and then I can fit the analytical solution to the experimental observation. So I observe the material on the atomic level. I have the solution on the mesoscale. I can fit the mesoscale solution to atomic observation, and I get these unknown parameters. So all of a sudden, these simple equations with some unknown constants, they're still simple, but the constants are now known and uh, with a pretty reasonable error bar. So I feel good about it. In fact, uh, I don't necessarily have to use analytical solutions. I can use the numerical solutions. So this is an example of much more recent work when we look at the lead titanate. 
in this strontium titanate, so this is ferroelectric, this is not. Uh, you can see that if we zoom in on one unit cell, the central atom will be shifted. So the shift is a polarization vector, and I can see it measured directly by observation one atom at a time. And then I can take the map of these displacements and represent it as this color scheme, so they start to form vortices. And then I can match the experimental observation to theory. So in theory, there is a very sneaky parameter called flex electricity, which tends to manifest only on the atomic scale and hides behind electrochemistry on micro scale. So this parameter determines the shape of the vortex very significantly. So what I can do is I can take my experimental data, I can take my theory, and I can do the simple matching. And then I can see that I can determine the values of these parameters, and there is a reasonably steep uh, uh, quality surface, so I know it with a pretty well-defined error bar. That feels great. And then I ask myself a question. So I'm not sure if it is a uh, right audience for this, but when I was, so the, I guess the third confession I need to make is my parents are mathematicians. And uh, the j mathematical joke in Russia was that if you ask a physicist to make a tea, he will put the water in the kettle, f light the fire, put the kettle on the fire. And if you ask a Russian mathematician to make a tea, but you have the fire on and water in the kettle, he will pour the water out, he will extinguish the fire, and he will say that the problem is reduced to the one which have been already solved. And then the question that I asked myself is that are we doing the same thing here? We have the observation of the system on the atomic level. We have the mesoscale phase field theory which were developed in order to explain the behavior of the mesoscale system if we cannot observe them on the atomic level. So can we do better? Let's look at the, how the physics works in general. So on the one end, we have people that develop microscopic models. So for a simplicity, if we deal with the own lattice, it would be Ising, Heisenberg, Kitaev, and more, more complex. So if they develop the Hamiltonians, they simulate them, or whatever can be solved analytically is solved analytically, and you calculate macroscopic observables, like the properties or susceptibilities or fluctuations and so on. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people who make real materials, who measure all these parameters, and then we match ma predicted observables to the experimentally determined observables. And of course, the caveat is sometimes there is a discussion of whether this material is Ising universality class or Heisenberg universality class. So sometimes it gets interesting. And then the question becomes, uh, can machine learning help us make this connection? So interestingly enough, only uh, three years ago, Melkish pu published the paper when you showed that you have a lattice model and you can use machine learning to compress it to microscopic observables. But more interesting question is, can you use the machine learning directly to match observation, the modeling, on the level of the microstructural degrees of freedom? So if I see atoms one at a time, can I use it to recover the generative physics of my model? So, Again, let's start with the very simple things. So I guess the most simple thing is the Ising model in two dimensions. So it's supposed to be very easy, so you can give it to the graduate student. So we give it to the graduate student. And the uh, graduate student calculated the phase diagram where this axis is J, this axis is temperature. And even when you see it by eye, you can see that this is anti-ferromagnetic domain, this is a ferromagnetic domain, this is the paramagnetic domain. And uh, the reason why I represent it in this way rather than in reduced variables exactly because even if you look at it by, you can see roughly where you are in the parameter space. So question becomes, if I just have a snapshot of Ising model, can I reconstruct what is J from observations? And the answer is it's possible using the statistical distance minimization method developed by Lucas Wilsek. And uh, this is the example of how it works. So why is it important? It's important because, for example, in this case, J is 0.65. The phase transition is at 1.7. And the classical physicist will do the measurements from here to here. You want to capture your phase transition and your measurement interval. But if you look at this axis, the reconstruction of the interaction parameter is possible at the temperatures well above transition temperature. Why does it matter? It matters because there are a lot of uh, very high resolution room temperature microscopes in the world. There are very few liquid nitrogen 
microscopes. And there are none to my knowledge of high resolution liquid helium electron microscopes. There are plenty of scanning probes, but not electron microscopes. If I come to the physical community and say, look, I can learn the physics that you are interested in at temperature which is 10 times higher the phase transition, that's amazing. In fact, this reconstruction doesn't work below the transition temperature because there is no step probability. You have a uniform system. Of course, the question becomes, OK, that's wonderful. You have a perfect reconstruction. How much do you trust it? OK, this is where the uncertainty quantification comes into play. And I say that at these temperatures, I trust it a lot. And this is where the realistic noise is probably is going to make a problem. But the important thing is that I know how to do the UQ. Does it work in experiment? Well, let's pick an interesting system. So this is a solid solution of uh, rhenium sulfide and molybdenum sulfide. So rhenium is a happy atom, so, uh, heavy atom. So when there is a little bit of rhenium, you start to see a small number of them. If you I add more rhenium,s you see more and more and more bright atoms. So two things happen. First of all, when rhenium,s are inside the solid solution, they form some configurations. Second thing, when I have enough rhenium,s you can start to see that the symmetry changes. This is a perfect uh, a hexagonal lattice. And here you see that there are stripes. So there is a physical symmetry breaking. So I have a system when there is some chemistry going on, doping. And I have some physics going on, symmetry breaking on the atomic level. So of course, I can study it by calculating Fourier transforms or pair distribution functions. And you can see that here, we have a six sharp minima. Then minimum become broad and split. And then minima become split and narrow. So I have the noise. And I have the symmetry breaking at the same time. And then the question becomes, what can I learn from this data? So I've shown you an example of the Ising model. Obviously, the uh, solid solution is, has the Ising universality class. So what I can do is I can take all the configurations from my experimental observations. And then I can say that, look, I can consider the pair additive model with the nearest neighbors and next near neighbors or the many mod body model. And I can learn the interaction parameters between the rhenium atoms just from the statistics of the observations. And that turned out to be extremely <laughs> complicated problem because they are weakly repulsive. So of all the systems that are difficult to calculate, the weakly repulsive is the worst case because you really need to trust your UQ quite a lot. But it's doable. And then we ask the second question. If we can learn the thermodynamics just from a uh, local observation, can we learn something about the physics? And the idea here is the following. So imagine that I take an atom and I define its atomic neighborhood, so though thy neighbors. Then I can use something very simple, like principal component analysis, to reconstruct the statistics of these distortions. And what's interesting is that the first uh, statistical normal vote, this is just expansion or contraction. This is just a bigger strain, which happens because one atom, or atom of rhenium have different volume than atom of molybdenum. But the second one shows a very ordered pattern. So two atoms go away, and two atoms come closer. Why does it matter? It matters because when I did this analysis, I didn't impose any constraints on symmetry or anything else. This is just a statistical analysis of the images. And it gives me the picture which makes a lot of sense. It's a distortion in one symmetry-defined direction. What can I do next? Well, you know what? This system is not ideal. We have a fluctuations of coordination, of, com of, of concentration. So on the macroscopic level, this is just one concentration. But on the microscopic level, this is a distribution of local compositions. And I already know what is the distribution because I have a generative model. So what I can do then is I can take all my compositions and I can analyze the statistical distortion modes. And I can analyze them versus global and local composition. And all of a sudden, my first mode doesn't depend on local composition. My third mode kind of broadens. But my second mode shows the symmetry breaking. So if I play a little bit with the data, you can see that for local compositions, when there is a small number of rhenium atoms, there is no symmetry breaking. And for high composition, there actually is a symmetry breaking. So what I did in this case is that I took the atomically resolved data and I did something that uh, I kind of uh, I studied the phase transition from the bottom up. Classically, you study the symmetry breaking on the macroscopic objects, and now we have a way to study it on the on the uh, level of individual atomic neighborhoods. And notice that in this case we just scratched the surface. We just did the principal component analysis and counting on configuration. Think what can a good physicist, a good mathematician, do with this type of data?
Now, so I happen to actually collaborate with people who have good mesoscale theory, so they now try to actually build the uh, Ginsburg-Landau theory based on this observation, which kind of goes somehow. But then uh, the question becomes, what's next? And uh, how does it kind of go in the whole idea of how we do science? So there is this very famous statement by Donald Rumsfeld about the things that are known knowns, things are known unknowns, and things which are unknown unknowns. So statement is remarkably smart. So it happens that my wife is actually from Iran. And one thing that you know when you're married with Iranian or interact with Iranians is that argument would be that the all great things were done in Iran at some point in time before. So it turns out that there is a uh, poem by Odin to see uh, in uh, 13th century, which says exactly the same thing. And in his case, unlike uh, Rumsfeld, he even uh, points to what is the enabling technology for studying science. And Iran at that time, it was only using donkeys. So it looks like that there is it. But it turns out that once you read a few books of the normal mathematics, you realize that we actually deal with the fourth case, that uh, a lot of things in science is uh, Bayesian in nature. We have some forward models. We have the domain expertise. We need high performance computing because the, what happens in the denominator is usually a problem. And this is what we want to learn. And it turns out that the reason why I'm very optimistic about the next uh, several years, at least as far as science is concerned, is that there is a fourth class of variables, which is the unknown knowns. So experimentalists tend to know the priors. In fact, they tend to know them very well. So the, for me, there is a great potential for actually combining the prior experimental knowledge and the generative models to figure out how do we move forward and discover new mechanisms. Now, for physics, it would be easier or doable. There are more complex cases. So for example, the, when you do the microscopy, it's not always the case that your uh, atoms stay in place. Very often they move. And the movement can be something simple as jumping on the hole to defect formation to much more complex processes. And you can observe them in real time. So what can you do here? So we did a little bit of work in this type of systems when we create a neural network that finds only point defects and ignores all other defects, and then it kind of classifies those defects. And then you can start to convert your data into these psychedelic diagrams that show the evolution of the defect systems in the system. So x, y is the image plane. This is time. You can see that some defects appear and disappear, just a generation recombination processes. Some defects seem to meander, and some of the defects stay in place. So for those that meander, we can formally uh, calculate the diffusion process. For those that stay in place, we can analyze either the same time or not. It turns out they are not the same type. So if you look at their shapes carefully, they kind of change configuration. And then if you go backward and forward between the theory and the uh, experiment, you can figure out that we can even identify them. So this is a molybdenum atom on the tungsten side. It sits in place. It cannot move. But what it can do is it can uh, uh, attract the sulfur vacancy. So there are four possible configurations of this particular defect. You have an isolated molybdenum atom or molybdenum vacancy dimer, and the sulfur can be in three possible configurations. And we can even calculate the <coughs> matrix probability, uh, Markov probability matrix between those. So of course, this is not a true chemical process. This is a beam-induced process, but still it's kind of cool. And uh, for more complex system where the bonding uh, changes, life becomes very complicated. And this is the area where we can uh, particularly looking for ideas and collaborations. Because if the bonding geometry changes, how are you going to study it? We did some experiment when we find all the silicon atoms in the system. Then we apply the Gaussian mixture model and see what happens. And what's interesting is that Gaussian mixture model reconstructs the chemical neighborhoods around the silicons. Why is it important? It's important because the model was not told that atom exists. It gives the preferential observation of the images, and this have chemical sense. So I guess one thing we can do is just plug them in into the DFT, but I'm sure there are more elegant way, uh, things that can be done. And again, we can find the probability, transition probabilities. Now, in the remaining few minutes, let me show you some examples of what we can do even if we don't understand the theory very well, but utilize the fact that our machine learning is directly connected to the microscopes, or to some extent directed, uh, connected, and uh, in some extent would be in the future. 
So there is a very famous statement by Feynman that what I cannot create, I do not understand. So the problem is that, first of all, it's not quite true. And secondly, you can find the uh, Feynman statement for any occasion on the Feynman statement VK. But it's, it sounds good and sort of immediately obvious. But once it comes to the uh, creation, the question becomes how low can we go? And the key accomplishment now is this using scanning probe microscope to write IBM, so that's what launched uh, nanoscience. And uh, it was great physics and great PR for 25 years and not, useless, uh, not useful other ways. But in the last five years, because of the need for quantum computing, this is pretty much the only technology you can make a solid state single atom qubit. So all of a sudden it actually is useful. The second way you can make molecules uh, is obviously chemical synthesis. So I showed the example of uh, molecular machines, but uh, biology operates the same way. So if you want to create atomically defined units, you either do it atom by atom or you do it by chemical synthesis. The question is, is there a third way? And it turns out that there is. So I showed you an example that the electron beam changes solid. And then the question becomes, can we make this change controllable somehow? So we started to work on it about five years ago when one of my colleagues uh, looked at the strontium titanate. So this is crystalline strontium titanate. This is amorphous strontium titanate. If you scan the beam here, the beam starts to dump energy in the lattice. And amorphous strontium titanate crystallizes to make a crystalline strontium titanate. And you see how this protrusion grows. And again, the small blobs are atoms. So you crystallize material and you observe it with atomic resolution. So at that time, I was working primarily in the SPM field. And in SPM, it is very common to use your scanning probe microscope to change objects. So the reason why it happens is ironically because electron microscope is much more expensive. So do anything unusual with four million dollar machine is much more nerve wracking exercise to do something unusual with the $200,000 machine, which I can also fix myself if anything goes wrong. So we experimented with uh, writing the logos of our funding agencies. So at that time, I really like Rammstein. And uh, my colleagues don't forgive me to this moment because they still think that Rammstein is not music. But the important thing is that we knew how to make AFMs to write needed structures. And the question becomes, can we combine two and two together? And we were able to do it. So this is the example of the case when we scan the electron microscopy beam in the predefined pattern to write ORNL. Uh, so you can zoom in. You can see that this is a crystalline strontium titanate in the matrix of the amorphous strontium titanate. So this is probably a, the world's smallest uh, 3D printed system, except that, of course, we still need to remove the amorphous strontium titanate. That's not terribly difficult, but that's probably about a year of work in microfab to figure out how to do it properly. And nobody cares about the strontium titanate 3D printed nanostructures. But then the question for us becomes, can we automate the process? And uh, the idea here is that can we engender the feedback between our control system and this $4 million electron microscope? So a few years ago, we made the first version of this feedback when we just scan our beam. And uh, when we scan, uh, scan parallel to the interface, and when our beam is inside the material, it, uh, uh, we measure the, calculate the Fourier transform. And once we're inside, we see peaks corresponding to the Fourier transform of the atom. Once we shift our beam into the amorphous phase, the Fourier transform peak disappears because material is amorphous. So then we stop scanning. And we keep scanning across, the, uh, we stop scanning in this direction. We keep scanning in this direction, and material starts to crystallize. We detect the Fourier transform peak intensity, and that gives us the feedback signal when the material is fully crystallized. And once we crystallize one plane, we move to another location, and this basically create a second plane. So we crystallize material one atomic plane at a time. And this is how the process looks like. So this is crystalline strontium titanate. This is uh, amorphous, so we draw these lines. This is a low uh, dose imaging, because we don't want to uh, induce crystallization in wrong places, but it works. And then we can uh, start to do the normal imaging and we can zoom in again, we see atomic resolution. So the process works remarkably well. What's interesting is that it works not only for strontium titanate, it actually works for silicon as well. We can crystallize silicon in the same pattern, which is rather important. But then the question is, can we go from atomic planes to the single atoms? The answer is yes, he can. So these are two movies which are 
uh, manual. So this was a postdoc who spent 16 hours in the lab figuring out how to make the atoms move. But in this case, you have our favorite silicon atom in graphene. And by positioning the electron beam in the right orientation, we can make the silicon atom to go in circles. So the movie is looped, so the atom was going in circles that it got tired and uh, disappeared. So obviously, uh, you're not going to get anywhere if you move in circles. So we also made the atom move in the straight line or straight for government. Uh, work <laughs> and uh, what we are doing now is we are trying to kind of connect our deep learning networks and this manipulation in order to make the process fully automated so as you can imagine that takes time because microscopes are expensive you need to be very careful and you always have to deal with the invisible things like sample preparation and so on but it start to work and in the meanwhile we kind of learn how to assemble structures like this you can move two silicon atoms together three silicon atoms and so on so these are basically artificial molecules which are created one atom at a time by the electron beam. So it kind of feels interesting. So just to finish my talk, so what are the opportunities? So for quite a lot of time, the way we did the fundamental science was through the X-ray uh, and neutron scattering techniques. They were giving us quantitative information. They informed our thinking. So the difference between physicists and chemists, among other things, is that physicists tend to think in the K space, and uh, chemists think in the real space, for example. But what happens in the last several years is that we start to have the electron microscopes and scanning probe microscopes that allow us to visualize the materials on the atomic level. And they allow to do it in the quantitative fashion. So we not simply see the movies or images. We know the atomic coordinates. We know a lot of properties like eels or for system which are related to functionality. So in some sense, we know what the atoms do. And we can start to ask questions that what are the local functionalities? Why do atoms do it? How we direct them to do what we want? And none of this can be done unless we figure out how to connect this to the greater physics world. And machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence is the only way to do it. There is simply too much data otherwise. So thank you. And uh, oops, sorry. And let's stay in touch.